So thanks for joining me for the lecture regarding 5.4.1. So essentially, this will be mainly regarding the Bloch theorem, which is a very important and fundamental theorem that we are using to understand periodic structures. And before that, we will really start with a very brief one slide introduction on the whole section regarding 5.4. And that will be our section on nearly free electron model. And after that, we will actually go into our main lecture topic, which will be the Bloch, Bloch theorem and its derivation. And during this derivation of the Bloch theorem, there are many ways to derive the Bloch theorem, but uh, we will choose to use a solution based or derivation based on solution of the Schrodinger equation. And that's what we will do then first in our upcoming lecture. And then when we have solved the Schrodinger equation for a periodic solid, then we start solving and, and then we start having our uh, Schrodinger equation where we really have a non-zero periodic potential function. So remember in section 5.3, focusing on free electron model, the potential was zero potential here and now we are going beyond that assumption. And during this derivation, of our Bloch theorem, we will also transform the Schrodinger equation that we have, and that of course is a differential equation, and we will turn that into an algebraic, an algebraic equation, and that equation is known as the central equation, so please be warned that they will also come about with a new equation that bears a name, and we will really use that equation later on, so please bear that in mind. So this is what we will have in the upcoming lecture of, of the next, let's, let's guess, uh, 45 minutes. So let's start with the brief introduction on our like section in, in general. So we basically, like, uh, we will have, or, or what we are covering in, in this chapter 5, is that we will generalize this treatment now into a broader class of solids. The, like uh, how we do that is that the, so far we have really, really considered a free electrons. So essentially we have considered a potential that is zero. And now what we want to do in the upcoming 5.4 section is that we will introduce this a uh, free, nearly free electron model. And there essentially what we are doing is that they, we are introducing to you a non-zero potential. So you are is not zero anymore. And this will of course affect the movement of electrons and many interesting things actually comes about by, by extending this model of ours. And after these improvements, basically almost all of the properties of metals, the main properties can at least be understood, maybe not calculated from our initial calculations of our approaches, but at least we can understood the main properties. And the nice thing is that we can understand their properties from the microscopic point of view. So based on the microscopic description. So this is what we will then do essentially in the upcoming four lectures. And let's now proceed to the actual main thing. So that will be the derivation and introduction of the Bloch theorem to you. So what we will do here is that we will try our best to derive the Bloch theorem. I'm not sure how well I will manage, but at least I will try. And how we do that is that we will first Yet again, introduce to you the Schrodinger equation, and it will be the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And that will, of course, be h bar squared, the, the kinetic energy uh, operator, and h bar squared times the Laplace operator divided by two times the mass of an electron times our wave function psi, and that will be a single electron wave function. And now we have the potential here also in our Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, and now that can be non-zero periodic potential. So please remember, we are now treating a electron in a periodic piece of a solid, and that's why we also need, need to impose those periodic boundary conditions into our problem. And then we have on the right-hand side, we have the energy associated with this wave function times psi. So in a way, what the Schrodinger equation tells us, once we have found the solution, it also tells us it tells the wave function, how the electron moves, what kind of entity it is, and it also gives us the energy. So how, how the, the electron oscillates uh, as a function of time. So they're essentially giving its, its energy contribution. 
So here, psi is our single electron wave function, u is our effective potential function, the, the details how it will look like, uh, we can leave, leave that later. In the next lecture we will be treating the simplest of uh, periodic poten potential that we can imagine, so essentially a square potential, but uh, let's not go into there yet. And E is our total energy that is associated with this single electron wave function psi. And this equation and its solutions, of course, so far they have provided us basically all the understanding that we have uh, come about already, and it will do so in the future. So this is a, maybe a good thing to remember. Many times in, in quantum mechanics and in solid state physics, things boil down into solving a Schrodinger equation. Many times, also in, in fiber optics, it also boils down in, in solving the generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But more, more on that in the course on, on nonlinear optics. But next, we want to understand how the problem that we are about to face, how we can really solve that when we have a non-zero potential. So u that is periodic and non-zero. And how we can do that is that then we must really introduce the Bloch theorem to understand the forms of our solution, what kind of solution we may have into this problem. And the Bloch theorem, in words, what it means is that essentially it says that the eigenfunctions, size, of our wave function for a periodic potential u, they are essentially of a given form. So they are products of a plane wave component, so exponent ikr, times a function uk, that is a given given function that does have some kind of provide does provide some kind of deviation to the to the eigenfunction from a plane wave. But rather what this still says to us is that the, it will be nevertheless like almost like a plane wave quantity that will be our eigenfunction. So how, how the electron seems to be moving about will be almost like a plane wave quantity. And this function uk, uh, that really exhibits the periodicity of the crystal lattice. And that will be the, the kind of easy to see restriction that the crystal lattice provides in the allowed solutions for the single electron wave functions. So this is what the Bloch theorem says in words. And then let's, maybe this is the more easier thing to understand first first and then maybe it's then after you understand the mathematical language and mathematical meaning of the Bloch theorem maybe you then understand also the words what it means. So what we have is that the <coughs> we have a psi k and that will be our eigenfunction psi of the wave equation. I'm just denoting that this is a specific solution with a sublabel of k so that the, this is not just like a single eigen solution to the problem that we actually may have many and this is one of those and then this must be equal to a plane wave component exponent ikr times uk component where uk is a function that is lattice periodic so essentially this u term here function here exhibits the periodicity of the crystal lattice as was being said in the previous slide so let me, let me repeat, psi k is a single electron eigenfunction, and this is known as Bloch function, or so-called Bloch state. And uk is lattice periodic function, so of course that then means, via definition of lattice periodic functions, is that then uk in a position of r must be exactly equal to uk in a position of r plus r, capital R, where capital R is the, the Bravais lattice vector. So that will be n1 times the generating vector a1 plus n2 times a2 plus n3 times a3, where all a's are the generating vectors of the lattice, and n i's are the integers. So r is our Bravais lattice vector. And these equations that we have, these two facts, so that we have the first equation and then we have the restriction for u that it is also lattice periodic. We can really combine them into a single equation and that would read us psi k in a position of small r plus capital R, the Bravais lattice is equal to exponent i k r times psi k r. And this is sometimes called the Bloch theorem, this equation here.
And essentially what it does is that it kind of like restricts the possible solutions that we may have for the electron wave function inside the periodic solid. So that's what it does physically. And maybe it really helps us that we will derive the Bloch theorem so that you could maybe better appreciate its meaning. So that's what we will try to do next. So that they, we, will, we will derive it so that hopefully you can better understand the meaning of the Bloch theorem. So what we will do first is that we will note that this psi k, the our eigenfunction, this of course needs to be uh, also a lattice periodic. So the, the periodicity of our system needs to be somehow like imprinted in psi k. And for simplicity, we just consider the simplest periodic uh, system we can consider, and that will be today a cubic volume that has a length of L, and this we will take to be our periodic unit cell. But of course, we could kind of like generalize this treatment to more arbitrary looking periodic structures. And then what we have is that they, we have a periodic system, so that then we will also have periodic boundary conditions, and they will, of course, yet again discretize the K. And this is what always happens when we have periodic boundary conditions. And since we have periodic boundary conditions and we have a periodic system, it's also smart to take use of the Fourier series description for the phi. So essentially, we can write the phi K, this given eigenfunction, like a, of our wave function, so that then we can write it as a summation of kx, ky, and kz over ck. So these are the constants like we can muster like a, after after taking a Fourier series description or a decomposition, and then we have the plane wave components. And of course, as before, like we have summation over the three tuple, so the three ordered integers that define the k wave vector k. We can just simplify our notation that they would just seem to be summing over one variable vector k, but of course we really do sum over three variables, so n, n x, n y, and n z. So this is what we will do, and I will try my best that in the in the sub labels I have the vector, so that then you know what the the, the meaning will be in practice. <clears throat> so then we will not just make many 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 summations, but we will rather just like use a little bit less clunky mathematical notation. And we know that the potential function, of course, that must also be a lattice periodic function, since it is describing a property of a periodic material, so that then this U can also be decomposed uh, using the Fourier series decomposition. And then we can sum over the reciprocal lattice vectors, G, and then we have the coefficients, UG, and then we have the playmate components, so exponent I, G, R. And now here g is our reciprocal lattice vector. So g, of course, is of the form n1 prime times b1 plus n2 prime times b2 plus n3 prime times b3. And here b, i, b2, and b3 are the generating reciprocal lattice vectors. Since this potential is a real valued function, it is a potential in real space, so we know that its Fourier transform will subsequently also be Hermitian operator, Hermitian function. And what that means is that when we take the Fourier series de decomposition, we know that if we would have the index g to be a minus g, then we can know that the, this is actually the complex conjugate. This is equal to the complex conjugate of g, ug. So this is due to the fact that if we have a Hermitian function, then this must be true. And now we give the derivation of the Bloch theorem a little bit of a rest, and we will make a detour, and we will first solve the Schrodinger equation as I promised, and only after that we will complete our derivation of the Bloch theorem. Because once we know the solution of the Schrodinger equation, we can really quite simply, in a few lines, we can follow the derivation of the Bloch theorem and complete it. So what we will do is that now we have the forms, we have the, the psi, the wave function, or, or kind of like trial, and we have the periodic potential, and what we can now do is that then we can try to also solve just the, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation and see what, what we get as a solution. Do they comply with the, with the trial based on the Bloch theorem? 
for the eigenfunction psi. So we insert these four, two Fourier series descriptions of our variables into the Schrodinger equation so that they recall we have the Schrodinger equation. You have the kinetic operator minus E plus the potential and this is multiplying our wave function psi and this is now equal to zero. So this is basically the, our uh, <coughs> Schrodinger equation and what we can now do is that we can insert First of all, first, first of all, the Fourier series description for the wave function psi, and after that, we will insert the Fourier series description of our periodic potential function. So what we get is that the, now we get the, the insert the wave function psi, and essentially that will be the sum over case, and then we have the coefficient ck times exponent ikr, and this is now slightly modified the Schrodinger equation. And now we do the same uh, insertion for the periodic potential, and then we are having a similar kind of end result here. And of course, this looks pretty bad to summations, and in fact, uh, six summations because they are like actually like summation over three tuples, so that they, they uh, this is this is looks pretty bad and dramatic at first sight. But let's 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 not be bothered. Like uh, we we know that we can actually solve this, and we can first look at the kinetic energy term and and see what we learn for for that. What kind of uh, solution we can have, or our simplification of that, and then we will look at the potential term. But let's look first at the kinetic energy term. So this, of course, will be of a form that we have the kinetic energy term multiplying our wave function. And now, like uh, essentially, we can put in, and, and we should put in the, the, the operator, the kinetic operator inside the summation. What we have left is that we have the summation over the k minus h bar squared divided by 2 times the mass of an electron Me times ck. These are coefficients, so of course, the only where the, the, the Laplace operator operates, that will be the plane wave components. Now the nice thing about of, of Fourier transforms and Fourier series is that the, the differential operators that are operating on plane wave components, they are actually quite solvable. So that we know right away that they, we can actually calculate this, this differential operator and the, the Laplace of a plane wave, plane wave will result in a term of ik squared. So this is now that we can actually solve the differential equation once we have transformed our function from the real space description into the reciprocal space description, as Joseph Fourier done on his own uh, endeavors on the Fourier series and, and uh, the, the kind of conduction of heat in systems. <clears throat> so now what we are left is that they, we are just basically transforming this, this, this ik squared term to be the, the minus sine times the k squared, and now we are left with, with the kind of uh, solution for the kinetic term. And let me just try it out the summation open, so that they, we, we know for sure that what this uh, summation over k vector means is that we actually really have three sums over the indices of mi, m2, and m3 primes, and then we have h bar squared times k squared divided by 2 times me, and then of course these k, uh, ck's terms, they are actually uh, many, many, many coefficients that uh, we have m1 that depend on the m1, m2, and m3, and then we have the plane waves of these associated coefficients. So really we sum over the indices mi's of the wave vectors, and the wave vectors are, of course, of the form k equals m1 prime times m uh, b1 and so forth. This is what we already were covering earlier. <clears throat> so one could just also write the k, the wave vector, as a summation, summation from i uh, one to three of, of this form, m i times b i. So now we we have solved our Schrodinger equation and the kinetic energy term of that. And not, what we are left is that they, we will next need to solve also the potential term, and that what we will do next. And that this is actually quite not not that bad neither. <clears throat> so we are summing over the Fourier series description of the potential, and, and this is multiplying our potential ck exponent ikr terms. So what we are faced is that they, we try try our best to simplify this, but nothing much can be done in order to simplify things.
So the only thing what we can do a little bit to simplify our our math here is that uh, we can get rid of the the g plus k term here, so that we can simplify this slightly by just changing our summation from k to k prime, where k prime will be g plus k. So we can really transform these two sums. It doesn't really matter physically if we change the summation index. So we can really change the summation over k to be sums over k primes. And now this k prime will be g plus k. And now we can simplify the plane wave term so that instead of g plus k, it actually will be just a k prime. And we have defined essentially here, the trick here is that they will change the summation from k to k prime, which is g plus k. And like I said, physically nothing changes, so we can really do this change in the summations. And now we can combine the two terms that we have just discovered, the kinetic energy term and the potential term, and then we can write our Schrodinger equation in a form that we are summing over k's, uh, the plane wave components, so exponent i k r's, and then in the inside the curly braces, we have <coughs> or curly brackets and just braces. So h bar squared times k squared divided by 2 times me minus our energy times ck. And then we sum over uh, k's with the, the ugs. So these are the potential, uh, potential coefficients in the Fourier description times ck minus g's. And this is equal to zero. So this is into kind of what kind of form we have now already formulated our original Schrodinger equation when we are having a periodic system and the electron is moving about. And the sum over k terms really they reduce to zero so this is this is uh, what we have in here. So that they like when we are summing many terms this must be zero so this really implies that actually maybe something in here must already be zero. And this is based on the fact that the, the plane waves, and this is what we are essentially summing, we know that the plane waves are orthogonal, so that they, they form an orthogonal basis, and then this means that the only way for this to be always zero is that this, this term inside the, the, the curly brackets, these each of these, they must vanish. Because otherwise there would not be any possibility for a sum over different plane waves to result in identically zero because the uh, plane waves they form an orthogonal basis. <clears throat> so wh what we have here is that they each each term inside the curly brackets they really must vanish. Otherwise the above equality cannot be true. And then this gives us something that already looks a lot simpler than what we started with. So we have h bar times, uh, sorry, h bar squared times k squared divided by two times m e minus e times c k plus the summation over g's. There's a reciprocal lattice vectors times u g times c k minus g, and that must be equal to zero. And this is nice. Like maybe you don't see it right now, but this is not a differential equation anymore. But this is just an algebraic equation. So we have transformed our differential equation, the Schrodinger equation, into an algebraic equation by essentially solving it in the reciprocal space. We do not say it loudly, but the, essentially what we did is that we took Fourier transforms of our objects and now we are solving, we are providing a solution in the reciprocal space. So essentially we are, we are providing a solution as a form of sums of plane waves propagating in different directions. And of course, if we would want to have a solution in the real space, then we would just provide an inverse Fourier transformation, and then we would have our solution in the real space. And this algebraic equation, this is the one that we know also as the name central equation, and we will come to this later on when we are treating the chronic penny model. <clears throat> And now we are ready to proceed and, and complete the derivation of the block theorem that we started with. Sorry about the detour, but uh, sometimes it's good to make a detour so that we can really then uh, do the derivation more easily onwards. So now we have the block function, and, and we have the block function from a for a specific k. 
so a block state and then the, this icon function psi k is a sum over g's and then we have the c k minus g times exponent minus uh, uh, g sorry k minus g times r so this is our block, fu block function for a specific k so essentially an eigen function of our system that is associated with the specific k value and here please note that uh, we are summing here uh, possible uh, g and not all possible k values that are out there and i'm trying to highlight what this means in the below figure and, and, and that's that's important so we are really not summing all for over all k values here but we are summing over specific g values that are associated with the given periodicity periodic lattice that we are dealing with so like uh, this hopefully like clarifies this figure so below i'm plotting all the possible k values that are out there for a like one dimensional k and here i'm essentially plotting the, the g values and, and these are only the given values that are associated with a given periodicity so if you have the lattice constant a then the, the reciprocal lattice vector will be 2 pi times uh, 2 pi divided by a so then we see that only a specific k points actually uh, are related to this specific periodic lattice and here what we are doing is that we are forming this specific eigenfunction associated with this given periodicity by summing over very specific g values so this is the mathematical trick that ensures that whatever function we have out like coming out out of our math that really complies with the lattice periodicity that we have in our physical system so that's that's the kind of like a meaning here and an important thing to note that we are not really summing over k's but over g's <clears throat> and now we are almost there just um, <clears throat> what we are faced to left is that uh, we will rearrange the exponential that we have in our uh, equation and then we can write that the psi k the eigenfunction is of a form that we have a plane wave exponent e uh, exponent i k r and then we are having the summation over g times uh, c k minus g uh, exponent minus i g r and this of course will be essentially of the form that we have a now a plane wave and then we have this term inside the parenthesis that's essentially our lattice periodic function uk and that's it this is now of the form that we were looking for so this is of the form of the Bloch theorem so we have now shown that uh, we really solved the Schrodinger equation and, and the, we are getting solutions out they were of this form and, and then by just like uh, putting taking the, the k arb out we see that indeed it is of the given form and here like i already said that we are not summing over k's but we are rather summing over the specific g's this ensures that this u here is of the right form so this is a lattice periodic function as we want it to be and what we are left is that we just need to show that this potential that we have here really is a lattice periodic function so basically that it complies with the mathematical uh, definition for lattice periodicity so that ukr must be equal to uk in the position of r plus capital r and this is super easy to do by such recalling the identity that we have for the reciprocal lattice vector g and the bravi lattice vector r so exponent i g r is always unity and now we can just write mathematically like what is the uk in a position of r plus capital r and that's of course the sum over g's of the coefficients ck minus g's and then we have in the exponent minus g and then we just instead of like small r we have now the position small r plus big r we rearrange terms inside the exponent and then we just have that we have the term exponent uh, minus i g r and then we have the exponent minus i g r capital r here and please we know this this is the jacob khan based on the properties of the reciprocal lattice vector this is equal to one and then we are left with this term and this by definition this summation equals to our uh, lattice periodic function in a position of r and this completes 
our Bloch theorem derivation. And I did it in less than 30 minutes. I'm happy to myself. I thank you for your time and patience. And please like uh, join me in the next lecture where we are covering chronic penny model. Thanks and bye bye.